Um, so good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar on fungicide resistance management um, in New South Wales and Queensland. So today's webinar is brought to you by the Australian Fungicide Resistance Extension Network, um, or APRON for short. Uh, my name is Kylie Island and I am the Extension Coordinator for APRON and I'll be facilitating the webinar today. Um, and before we get started, some brief housekeeping, if I can get the next slide, Stephen. Yep, uh, so basically everyone should already be muted and we just ask that people keep on mute. We've probably all got a bit of experience with Zoom and things like that by now. To ask a question, we just ask that you go to the Q&A window is the best way to do that. And I'll show you how that works on the next slide. Um, you'll enter the question and then um, it'll be posted when we're ready to go. Very rare event that we'll have anything like a webinar hacking. If that happens, we'll um, send a new link in a few minutes. Um, and yeah, so next slide, please, Stephen. Well, yep, so basically for some background, um, AFRIN is a GRDC initiative um, in recognition of the fact that fungicide resistance is becoming a more serious and increasingly prevalent in Australian grains crops. Our remit is to deliver regionally specific resources and training to help growers and advisors understand the status, risks and management of fungicide risk resistance in Australian grains. And that regional aspect is really important because we're seeing different cases in different growing regions across the country and there are different risks associated with that. Um, and we're going to be doing this by developing and delivering a management guide on fungicide resistance, workshops, information sessions and webinars such as today, fact sheets, updates and email alerts. And we're able to do this work through harnessing the skills and expertise of plant pathologists, fungicide resistance experts and comms and extension specialists across the country. So on the call with us today from the AFRIN team, we have Lauren and Bridget from Ag Communicators in the background helping um, with the tech support. We've got Catherine Zulak from the CCDM who is a fungicide resistance diagnostics expert. Um, and as well as that, we have um, three of our Northern region plant pathologists. Um, and the Northern region is of course a massive region. And so we will hear first from the state-based um, New South Wales and Queensland serial pathologists, doctors Stephen Simpendorfer and Liesl Snyman on the current disease pro profiles in the regions and best management strategies associated with those. And that's important because effectively, very at a very practical level, good fungicide resistance management is predicated on good integrated disease management. Um, and so then Stephen and Liesl will provide some commentary on some fungicide interventions as a part of those IDM strategies um, this season, and which will link us to our final speaker, Professor Levante Kiss uh, from the Centre for Crop Health at the University of Southern Queensland, who will speak to the management of fungicide resistance in Queensland grains crops um, and some of the fungicide resistance management basics. So without further ado, I will throw straight to Stephen, um, uh, who can start setting the disease scene for 2020. Thanks, Kylie. So welcome, everybody. So yeah, the main aim here is just to give a bit of an update of what's happening so far this season. And I guess um, a bit of excitement with a bit of rain around on the weekend and fairly a lot of questions about what that's going to do to disease levels that are already existing in crops. Um, so yeah, we'll just go through a bit of what's happened. I think the main thing that caught us all a bit by surprise is the amount of um, stripe rust around. So this is in southern New South Wales, up into northern New South Wales. This picture here on your screen is of a crop of uh, Bennett, so DS Bennett. And you can see this is not a hot spot, this is a pretty big hot patch. And it's just been a run of circumstances. So you can see in the background, maybe you can see over in the corner some sheep there. Um, basically, you know, these went in quite early, given a good break and just come up and the sheep just can't keep on top of it with grazing. Um, and in a lot of these regions here, we've had uh, rain since about January. So we've had uh, volunteer wheat coming up since January and just been hung on to in some situations so they didn't have to hand feed anymore. And it's just created a bit of a green ramp or it has, it's created a green ramp leading the season. So um, certainly created some issues. You can see in the background, the fog. So just that run of, of foggy mornings and leaf wetness and this is the, you know, the picture that was taken by the agronomist here down at Lockhart. You can see that moisture in the canopy and the rust pustules there, just very conducive to disease development um, this year. 
big biomass crops, big canopies and, and just things kicking over in there. So it's not um, restricted to down around that southern uh, New South Wales, it's certainly other, th other places. And over the last two weeks we've had numerous reports of, of mainly DS Bennett um, with striped rust hotspots. So here's one at Bogabri, which is one of the first ones. Similarly around Dubbo, and yeah, there's numerous reports. The, the varieties at the moment where we've had uh, rust reports has been, you know, by and large Bennett, but also some Wedgetail, which is uh, susceptible to, to the older pathotypes. And it's also got into some Trojan as well, which we'll talk about the implications of some of that uh, going forward as well. So the big question has been, you know, why? Why have we got all this striped rust around? So certainly coming off a couple of years of drought, we didn't expect a lot of striped rust problems because uh, striped rust or all the rusts are what we call a biotroph. They need a living plant to survive. So they need that green bridge of volunteer wheat plants over the summer to survive between crops. So with that green ramp from January, we've certainly had that hosting there. But the underlying issue is development of a new pathotype, which is called the 198 pathotype. It's a mutation of the, the Jackie for people who are into this stuff. Probably not too many, so I won't go into it too much. But uh, yeah, so it's, it's really quite interesting. So this has been, been around for a while. It was first detected in Victoria, Tasmania in 2018 at low levels. And certainly last year, even in a dry year in 2019, there was four sites that was recovered from in New South Wales, two in Victoria, and not as far up as Queensland. So we were talking about this in, in the update. So the key thing with this is that the pathogens actually changed and evolved um, to overcome some resistance genes. These are some photos from last year from Andrew Milgate, who's the pathologist for New South Wales DPI down at uh, Wagga Wagga. And you, know, you can see here the rust level with this pathotype in Trojan. The other thing, if anyone's got durum in, get the message out there, you're gonna have to monitor your durums. They've dropped in their resistance as well and you can see uh, the levels of strike rust in there. Okay, and basically what it's done, people have missed it, it's actually seen a change in the resistance ratings to strike rust to this new pathotype. So once this becomes distributed, it actually yeah, changes what's gonna happen in your crop. So the big one that dropped was DS Bennett. So with this pathotype, it's dropped from a resistance rating down to a susceptible rating, okay? And that's happened progressively over two seasons. So unfortunately, but a lot of people have still put Bennett in this year working off a 2018 rating, which is, um, you know, just haven't picked up on it. And yeah, they've actually been alarmed with the amount in there. So Illabo dropped as well, but only a minor bit. Um, and the ones here that, that haven't, uh, haven't changed certainly is that the Lantus has still maintained an MR rating and flank our RMR, because I'm going to talk leaf rust in a second. As I said, that other variety, Trojan, so Trojan's dropped in its resistance as well. So the issue that we have is these main season uh, plantings for a run of circumstances, that uh, certainly that green ramp into the season, a cut back on the use of flutriophile, so which takes the pressure out, certainly across regions. We've got a very early epidemic this year, and that's going to put pressure on our main season planting. So varieties such as Trojan will be getting inoculated off uh, those longer season varieties. Okay, so the key message here is that, that fungal pathogens change, okay? So this is just a natural evolutionary process that goes on. And I guess the other one I want to make people aware of, so we're caught up in the striped rust situation at the moment, and I think the awareness is certainly out there with Bennett and other varieties to look out for. But there is a new pathotype of leaf rust around as well, called the LR24 pathotype. And you can see here, it actually changes the ratings of some of our uh, varieties here. I guess the one I'm most concerned and people to be aware of is Lancer. So once we head north, Lancer makes up about 80% of our, our uh, winter wheat um, planting, APH varieties. So it's actually dropped down to a moderately susceptible. So it's something we need to keep an eye, eye out and monitor for. It will come in later than stripe rust. Stripe rust likes it cooler. So if you add your max min temperature together, divide it by two, stripe rust likes it around 15. Whereas if you add it together and divide it by two, leaf rust likes it closer to 20. So it always comes in a bit later in the season. We've get, we're getting confirmed, but we have got our first uh, situation in Illabo, which has dropped to an S to this uh, LR24 from out around Canamble. So I think uh, just keep an eye out for things of what's going on. But certainly a big question that's been asked is, well, is this the death of DS Bennett, you know, that it's dropped to an S rating? It is manageable, but people are just gonna have to acknowledge what that rating is and put management in place. But we go back to the old minimum disease standards, the risk still with when you're growing things that susceptible is you're producing so many spores out in the system. So the probability of having a mutation that results in a genetic breakdown in genetic resistance is uh, increased. I'll leave it to Leventus to talk about uh, um, fungicide resistant in rust, really not a lot of evidence of it globally for whatever reason. Um, but yeah, it's worth, I think, covering that. 
So key message here, fungal pathogens evolved to overcome genetic resistance, so why can't they do it similarly for fungicides? You know, they're basically just trying to survive in the system. So if the, one of the first key messages, if you want to actually, you know, limit the build-up of fungicide resistance or prevent fungicide resistance, limit the selection pressure, pressure on the actual pathogen. Don't use fungicides. Or if you are going to use fungicides, only use them where it's warranted. Um, and this is, this is certainly an issue this year. So with a lot of people coming off drought and having big early crops, good biomass in there, um, it's, it's actually quite interesting. And, and I guess people panic and is the potential there to jump at shadows. So here's some stuff that come in earlier, and it's actually contact herbicide damage, uh, a bit of spray drift, or um, we had a couple of inversions and causing this, these lesions. So people are sending these in thinking that it's yellow spot or some sort of disease and want to throw a fungicide at it. Okay, fungicides are not going to fix herbicide damage. Okay, they're totally different. They don't, don't interact with the fungal pathogen. The other thing that's out there a lot is, is various nutrient uh, issues. So whether it be nitrogen deficiency, uh, etc. And yes, yeah, certainly fungicides don't have a high nitrogen content. So putting a fungicide on to try and correct a um, nitrogen deficiency just doesn't work. So the key message here is get your diagnosis right first. And one thing I was taught very early in my pathology career is whenever I get a sample or walk into a paddock, I walk in there with the, the, the assumption that this is not a disease. And I have to do everything to convince myself that what I'm looking at fits with what we know about you know, distribution across paddocks, distribution with individual plants or leaves to convince myself that this is a disease. And then we take that back and we get a definitive diagnosis by doing some pathology on it. Um, and that's the, the I guess, the, the challenge is uh, for agronomists and growers is, yeah, think before you spray. Like, I think what happens a lot of times, you see any yellowing in a wheat crop, or if you see any brown spots in a barley crop, you go, it's disease, and I've got to hit it with a fungicide. That is not helpful. It'll just, um, if it's, it's not going to solve the issue, and it potentially selecting for resistance in some of our fungal populations. So yeah, fungicides first thing, use them only where needed. So there's some other thing going on. Sunmax is one wheat variety that's done a lot, but there's been a lot of others. We've had a pretty soft season until recently, and then a run of frost. And we're just getting this yellow tipping, okay, that's happening. And when you look at it, it's actually in a very specific leaf. It's been like the, the second uh, oldest leaf, and it's all this yelling towards the leaf tip. Okay, that doesn't happen with, with fungal pathogens. They don't concentrate to leaf tips. So automatically go, this just does not fit with, with what we'd expect. We see this every year in barley as well. Spartacus is one of the main varieties, but it's happening in a range of others. Again, yellowing towards the leaf tip, and we get these associated small brown spots. This is purely physiological. It's not related to fungal pathogens. It's just a stress response in barley, whether it be to frost or actual uh, herbicide applications around the time in a frost, and the plant just can't metabolize the herbicide quickly enough and you get this, but everyone sends these in and they're like, is this net, net botch, spot form net botch? I can tell you we've done that many uh, recoveries from it, trying to recover, it's definitely not disease. It is just a physiological response in barley. So wasting fungicides, particularly when they're in short supply this year on this sort of, sort of stuff is uh, not good for anyone. Okay, so that's the key message. The other thing is you're more than welcome to send stuff in. So that's my mobile number. So certainly for, for that Northern New South Wales, Central New South Wales or, or elsewhere, if you want to send pictures, good quality pictures, we can quickly have a look at, you know, take a picture of the distribution of the paddock, a picture of what it looks like in the plant and then on a leaf. Those three pictures, nine times out of 10, we can tell you very quickly what it might be, but more often than not what it definitely isn't. So if it, if it is a, uh, what we think might be a fungal disease, we'll ask you to then submit a sample so we can confirm that. But yeah, sometimes anything that fits with an operation like a spray uh, width or you know operation of a planter just does not fit. Diseases, fungal diseases just don't do that. Okay, but unfortunately this is the reality. So this is the samples that are coming in at the moment. This is in barley. Uh, you can see here you've got a range of physiological spottings. What we do as humid chambers, we cut sections of the leaf, put them in uh, a little petri dish with some moist tissue paper put it at specific temperatures and we can get it the, the cause of fungus to spirulate and we can identify it under the microscope. So this is what normally happens, but you've got here, so these ones uh, are actually physiological spotting uh, on, on the left. And quite often we see in Granger, but it happens in other varieties, they're just these tiny stress response. But there is some net blotch in there. So these bigger spots here are actually spot form net blotch. Um, and down on the, the other one down here. So this is reality, but then it's up to the agronomist or grower to figure out, well, what's the actual, how much is really in the crop? How much is just purely physiological? In this case, it was predominantly physiological with just a low level of, of net botch. So 
not saying it's easy. It's definitely not easy. Um, and that's why we've got the advantage, I guess, of having the pathology skills to, to get them to spirulate and look under, under the microscope. So, yeah, certainly Lisa, myself, and, and USQ are, are there to help with diagnosis. So, we can limit fungicide applications to where they're actually wanted. It's, it's good for the industry and, and certainly keep it. The concern is burning up short supplies of fungicides early. And when we warm up at the end of winter and into spring, when these pathogens, if you do have them in your crop, go to shorter cycle times, but waiting two to three weeks for product, if you can get it at all, is not going to be good if it does stay wet. The other thing too is just keep the diseases in, you know, losses in perspective. So this is Spotful Network, work we did at Grafton with Natalie Moore um, in 2018. Grafton's over on the coast, high humidity, which is really favours, you know, leaf diseases. So we got massive spotting in SS for um, susceptible, very susceptible varieties, so Spartacus in this instance. But when you look at it, if we did absolutely nothing, didn't put a single fungicide, just let the disease run its course under very conducive conditions, the yield loss topped out at 23%. Okay, so that is significant. But when you're talking about an intervention with a fungicide, you need to start from that as your worst case scenario point. And what we showed in that where we used a range of fungicide strategies, if you had to use Sestiva, so this is the, um, the product, recent product that's out that gives good, good early control, or if you had a sprayed with propoconazole at GS31, and then after that, the worst you could lose in really conducive conditions was 10% yield loss. So if you've done that initial fungicide application and these compete with each other, the seed treatment, then you, you reduced it to 10. So if you're coming back in with a second fungicide application, you're chasing 10% yield potential. Okay, so fungicides need to be an economic decision. You have to be making money at it. We're not in the game to lose money. Okay, the other th key point which we talk about every time, I don't get paid unless I mention this, is fungicides do not increase yield. They're purely protecting yield potential. So in that, I said that second application, it's 10% yield potential that you're trying to protect. So we just need to keep that in perspective. And it varies for the different diseases. It's all about how quickly a disease cycles and how big a lesion it produces and strips green leaf area up there. One last uh, one here is just quickly around uh, Sestiva, the active ingredient there. We did have issues last year around Cropper Creek where we had some crops treated with Sestiva and we got decent levels of spot form net watch in the canopy. The first assumption is, well, it's got to be fungicide resistance. You know, this product's not working. So we actually uh, collected isolates off there, sent them off to CCDM uh, over west, and basically there was no reduced sensitivity in lab tests. So we've ruled out that it's actually related to fungicide resistance or reduced sensitivity to, to this actual active ingredient. What actually happened is, fortunately for us on our heavy clay soils, we can grow on stored moisture. The crops got away early, got down into deep, the roots into deep moisture, but we had a very, very dry band around where the seed sat. And you can see you still got the product sitting on the seed here. So it just wasn't dissolving into the surrounding soil, being taken up through the roots and then distributed through the plant. So it's just a function of, of what was happening with dry soils. And I think we need to be aware of that in, in the north in particular, and that we can have you know, quite, quite rapid wetting drying cycles of that surface layer where these seed treatments are gonna sit. Last one, again, assistance is free. Uh, it's funded out of uh, Grower Levy. So we are happy to get uh, samples, get pictures and try and help through this to, to hopefully stop unnecessary application of fungicides and, and really economic uh, decisions are made when we do apply. And that's me. Okay, brilliant. Thanks for that, Stephen. Um... If I can just get Liesl to start her slides. Um, and just a reminder to send the questions through to that Q&A and we're just holding all questions to the end um, in the interest of keeping the webinar recording as a single um, slice. So, um, but yeah, we're really keen to hear questions and answer them at the end. So I'll hand over to Liesl. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. And um, yeah, thank you for uh, joining us. I'll just talk to you a little bit about the, um, you know, uh, the, uh, the Queensland more specific, a little bit more than New South Wales. Um, I'll talk a little bit about changes that we've seen um, in the landscape the last few years, and then also what I do expect some challenges that we could have in coming up in 2020. Um, firstly, I'll just talk a little bit about net form of net blotch. Most of you will probably know that you know, you see net form of net blotch almost every year in crops in the northern region. Um, we do receive quite a number of samples from um, agronomists, from growers for identification. 
um, and we also do some survey trips. One of the main reasons that we do that is because we do pathotyping on net form of net blotch. So that just gives us a little bit of an advantage so that we can see if there's varieties that are becoming vulnerable due to changes in the pathogen, as Stephen related earlier, you know, what they do. You'll see there in brackets, I have the number of samples that we've received um, every year over the last few years. And, you know, there's been quite a drop um, over years. In 2018, we only had a single sample and that was collected at the Hermitage. So it wasn't even from a commercial crop. But that's just an indication of the drought conditions we had over, um, you know, at least from 2017. With this pathotype we do, we know that in um, Queensland we still have kind of the same three main pathotypes that have been around for quite some time. Um, in a couple of years ago we identified two pathotypes, the one was virulent on the variety Maritime and the other one on Urambi. Um, ver maritime virulence have been common in the south. You probably, if you listen to you, Hallwork, um, he does talk a lot about the problems they have in maritime. Um, but it has never been um, detected in the north. Um, we don't expect any of these uh, new pathotypes to have any impact in the north, just because these varieties are not really suited to growing conditions here. Also due to the drought conditions, we haven't identified any new pathotypes in 2018 and 2019. We do know that with the years of the work that we've done on net form, um, the widespread cultivation of certain varieties put selection pressure on the pathogen to mutate and then increase in virulence for these varieties. So we always say to farmers, you know, really don't grow barley on barley. And even if you have to, if you really, if that's your best paddock, you have to grow barley um, in it every year. Just try and rotate your varieties. Don't grow the same variety in that same paddock in successive years. So over the last few years, we've definitely seen an increase of net form of net blotch in Commander Shepherd and Compass. And that was then because of the widespread cultivation of these varieties. Commander and Shepherd, they're both now totally susceptible to net form. Compass is rated as an MRMS. It does have some adult plant resistance. Um, with net form, we know that it is both seed and stubble born, and they just emphasize the importance of your management practices that you use. Spot form of net blotch, um, different to what we would have expected. Um, there was quite a lot of spot form of net blotch in Queensland in 2019. We received 23 samples from growers and agronomists for identification. And it was really spread across a wide area in Queensland. We received um, samples from up north, Bundaberg, Emerald, um, and even samples from Cropper Creek um, in northern New South Wales. Um, there's also, we received quite a huge number of samples from irrigated crops um, grown around Dalby and Chinchilla. So um, on, in August, we did a media release just, you know, because a lot of growers were just unaware that there was the problem with spot form. I've just put a little bit of a table in here. That information will be available on the NVT website and also in the 2020 um, Queensland Growers or Cereal Guide. You will see for net form of net blotch, if you look at it, um, there's, you know, like a slash. So there's different reactions and that's just because we have these three dominant pathotypes. Spot form of net blotch, we basically just have really one um, pathotype. But unfortunately, if you look at the coloring in there, you will see that we are really sitting dangerously with the resistance ratings of a lot of the barley varieties to spot form. There's a lot of them and, you know, quite popular varieties that are rated um, between susceptible to SVS. Uh, spot form of net blotch similar to net form is also stubble born. Um, the one big difference between these two pathogens, even though they are very closely related, is that spot form is not seed born. So if you have infected seed, we know both of them gets carried in the seed, but the spot form does not translocate into the seedling. So if you have seed that's infected with net form, um, if you grow it out, you will have lesions on very, um, you know, very the third and the fourth leaf. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. I'll maybe just talk a little bit of powdery mildew with a change in the season this year. Um, we already had some reports 
of powdery mildew from around the Mori area, um, specifically on Rosalind and Spartacus. Um, in 2014, we identified a new pathotype in Queensland, which is virulent on the MLLA gene. Um, so far, that has not been identified in any other region. Um, but yeah, we always ask people, if you see powdery mildew, you know, send us samples because we would like to see if that is more widespread than what we think. Um, and that um, one that is on Rosalind and Spartacus, that is that specific MLLA virulent one. We haven't detected any new virulences since 2014, and that's probably also just more a reflection of the type of conditions we had. There's a resistance gene, MLO, that is resistant to all isolates. This particular gene is very common in Europe. It has been used for a very long time. It's not that common in the Australian varieties yet, particularly on the Australian bred ones, but I think we will see a lot more of it in future particularly with varieties that's got a more European background. So if you look at the resistant varieties, you will see like the newer ones like RGT Planet, Granger and Westminster does carry this MLO resistance gene. There's also some other varieties that are resistant to powdery mildew or the, the strains we have in Australia, and they do carry some other resistance genes. Unfortunately, with the changes um, that we've seen in the pathogen, um, varieties like Commander, Compass and Shepherd, they've all lost their resistance um, and also then Latrobe um, and, and all of that, the varieties that are similar to Latrobe and related um, like um, Hindmarsh, Rosalind, Spartacus, they all carry that MLLA resistance gene. So all of them are quite susceptible now to powdery mildew. Another one that I want to talk about, I know as Stephen also said earlier, um, the rust pathogens, they are, they are regarded as quite a low risk, you know, for developing fungicide resistance. But I do think that stem rust is probably, I think that's one in the northern region that we definitely have to keep an eye out for, um, because it's one that just haven't got a lot of attention um, in the last few years. Um, and I do expect that that's something that's a bit, bit of a risk for us. Um, we did see an outbreak on the Western Downs in 2018, specifically in Bali. It was spread over quite a large area on the Western Downs. Um, and we received samples from a range of varieties. If you look at the names of the varieties I've got there, you will see it's the older ones like Rauch, Shepherd and Commander, but also a lot of new varieties like IGT Planet, Spartacus, Rosalind Banks. And I think that just gives us an indication on, you know, what's happening in terms of resistance to stem rust in barley. Barley, different from wheat, is vulnerable to attack by three different stem rust pathogens. The one is the normal wheat stem rust, um, rye stem rust, but then also there's another one, it's called scabrum rust. Scabrum rust is a hybrid between wheat and rye stem rust. And it's thought that this developed on common wheatgrass, which is also known as Elymus scabrum and Agrifyrin scabrum. And for anyone that knows what common wheatgrass look like, you can go into, into any paddock in Queensland and you will find it. It is just everywhere. In 2018, we did a survey from, for one of Robert Park's students. Um, she's working on, um, on scabrum rust. And everywhere where we did see um, common wheatgrass, we found some rust infections on it. The important thing to say is with that outbreak of rust, of stem rust on the Western Downs, all of the samples that we did send to Cobbity for pathotyping, they all did came back as scabrum rust. So not wheat stem rust or rye stem rust. Um, I have put in here the data, um, the wheat stem rust um, resistance ratings for the barley varieties. This data is collected by us in a field nursery that we do here in Queensland every year. You will see there's only three varieties at the top there, hind marsh, latrobe and litmus, um, that has any, any form of resistance to stem rust. So it just tells us that, you know, and those varieties are also quite related. So in terms of, of genetics, if we think about that, it just tells us that there's really virtually no resistance in the current um, barley varieties. If we look at what happened in 2018 with that stem rust outbreak, um, I think the last, the previous stem rust outbreak in Queensland was in 1998. So it was just exactly 20 years before that. We had favorable conditions with late rain in October, which led 
then to a flush of you know soft new um, leaf tissue and then also as we know that that inoculum is available on um, the the common wheat grass the important thing for us is that we emphasize is that scabrum rust is not it's not a pathogen of wheat so if you have wheat that is not something you need to worry about um, as Steve mentioned before, um, your rusts are biotroph pathogens. Um, we um, surprisingly get a lot of questions about, um, you know, about stubble and rust. It is not stubble born because they need that living tissue to survive on. If you look at the, the, the table, you, as I mentioned, all of, almost basically all of the varieties are really vulnerable to stem rust infection. And we know that, you know, if you have large areas planted with susceptible crop, if there's an outbreak, you will have lots of inoculum floating around, which will not impact just you, but also your neighbors. Stem rust is, is, is quite hard to control with fungicide. Um, a lot of growers, particularly in their good years, they will put in an early fungicide application when they do their herbicide applications. Stem rust requires that um, even higher temperatures than, than leaf rust, you're looking probably more around that 23 degrees Celsius, so that's a disease that you will get towards the end of the season. So if you have applied an early fungicide and there were no disease around, it's going to have no effect on that stem rust. That's only going to develop later in the season. Stem rust is also, because it's late in the season, you know, you, you're most likely to have quite a canopy. So it's very hard to get your fungicide there on the target area, which will be your stems. So with stem rust, it's really, if you realize you have a problem with stem rust, if you see any stem rust, you have to apply fungicide as soon as possible. The other thing that I maybe want to say with stem rust in Bali is that um, st stem rust resistance is particularly good in the wheat varieties. So currently, because we have all that resistance in wheat, we just don't have a lot of inoculum around. If that situation will change, we get a new virulent pathotype in that takes out a lot of wheat varieties and gives us a lot of inoculum. It will not only impact on the wheat industry, but also on the barley industry. Lastly, I maybe just want to say that, you know, most of the work that we do are funded by GRDC and that's been mostly through the grower contributions. Um, we are also at, um, at DEF Queensland, we are responsible for the diagnostics and surveillance of the winter cereals. So if you have any samples, you know, if you have any questions, like Steve said, we are there. That's why we're here for, um, you know, feel free to contact us. My contact details will be in later on in the presentation and also send us samples anytime. If you're not sure what a disease is, you just want us to have a look at it, play it out and confirm. Yeah, please um, send it to us. Thank you. Alrighty, thanks a lot for that, Liesl. That was amazing. Um, I'm going to start sharing screen now and uh, hand over to Levante to take us through. Just a quick reminder there to keep the questions coming and for Levante to take us through management of fungicide resistance in Queensland grain crops. Are you there, Levante? Yes, I'm here. Thank you kindly. Yep. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Sorry, I'll just uh, start up again. I'm just there, waiting yeah. for the slides. Yes, thank yep. you. Yep, have you got it? Is it showing the right? Well, no, not yet. No? Okay, I'm, this is, you'd think I'd ha I'd be used to this by now. Um, <laughs> best laid plans, and there we yeah. go. We can start with this, uh, with this map. With that slide, yep. Yes. There yep. we go. Yes. Apologies. So, Thanks, thanks again, Kylie. So my, my role in this webinar is to talk a little bit about general aspects of fungicide resistance and then about the situation in Queensland in particular. So let me start with this map produced by the Center for Crop Disease Management at Curtin University. This is a great overview of what has already been revealed in this field Australia-wide. Um, we have a number of well-documented cases then some of the strains of some of the crop pathogens, such as those uh, causing barley and wheat powder in your uh, barley net form, net blotch, uh, also wheat septoria, canola black leg, and so on and so on, uh, showed reduced sensitivity or 
complete full resistance to a number of fungicides. So I will come back to this map in a minute, uh, but now I would like to um, just introduce these very easy terms that we are using when dealing with the fungicide resistance. There are two terms here that are really important for us today, reduced sensitivity and full resistance to uh, a fungicide. We are talking about uh, full resistance uh, to a fungicide when the fungicide actually doesn't work anymore in the field. So it means that field failures have been detected and these uh, have been also confirmed uh, in the laboratory. Same for reduced sensitivity. In this case, the fungicide may still work, for example, at higher doses. Uh, however, the risk of uh, developing full resistance is there. And again, this has to be confirmed uh, in the laboratory. Why do we need this uh, laboratory confirmation? And how does this work? Uh, field failures could be due to a number of reasons, as we all know. Simply the wrong timing of the fungicide application, problems with the spraying, anything else can go wrong. So to be absolutely sure that uh, uh, a failure of a fungicide in a particular field is due to reduced sensitivity or uh, full resistance to a fungicide, we have to apply a number of classical and also DNA-based methods in the laboratory to confirm that this is indeed a case of fungicide resistance. Uh, if uh, the fungal pathogen is, um, grows well in uh, plates on artificial media, uh, then we do tests in, uh, in plates in the laboratory. If uh, these are biotrophs, and Steve and Liesl have already mentioned uh, these pathogens like powdery mildews and rusts, uh, then uh, we will uh, carry out classic fungicide resistance uh, tests in the laboratory. And we will also do uh, DNA uh, level uh, analysis uh, to detect one or sometimes more than one mutations in the crop pathogen, in those genes of the crop pathogen that are associated uh, with, the, uh, fungus, with, the, with the fungicide that has already been applied um, to control the disease. So when we have the results of these classic and also the DNA-based methods that both confirm that we have indeed a fungicide resistance there, then we will have a color dot on that map. So we can go back to this, this, uh, this map. And um, so we, we see here a number of, number of dots and uh, before talking about uh, some of these, uh, one thing is uh, clear. Uh, looks like there are absolutely no confirmed fungicide resistance cases in Queensland. Even that uh, light uh, blue dot there, close to the New South Wales-Queensland border, uh, is actually uh, based on a sample coming from New South Wales. So we can, we can actually say that so far we haven't seen any fungicide resistance cases well-documented cases uh, in, uh, in Queensland. Why is that? I will talk about this uh, in a minute, but before that, let me just uh, mention here a fungicide resistance survey uh, done in uh, New South Wales and Victoria. Uh, this slide and the next one uh, was received uh, from Andrew Milgate and uh, summarizes the, uh, their findings um, about uh, wheat septoria blotch in New South Wales and uh, Victoria. As you can see there, uh, those dots, uh, what was found uh, uh, in these regions in um, 2017 is that uh, there's a wide distribution of DMI resistance uh, in this particular crop pathogen in those regions that are covered by uh, those dots uh, on the map. <clears throat> in the meantime, no changes uh, were, uh, uh, were detected in the sensitivity to other fungicides uh, belonging to the strobilurins or the SDHIs, to two other groups of fungicides with different modes of action. So if we go to another slide, we will see that uh, these uh, fungicides that belong to these other two groups, strobilurins and SDHIs, 
uh, those still work perfectly against uh, wheat septoria blotch. However, in terms of DMIs, um, a number of products uh, have been uh, detected to be less effective, and one of those uh, is not effective at all. So it means that uh, that one uh, contributed to field failures of uh, fungicide uh, applications in New South Wales and uh, Victoria. To my knowledge, uh, no other uh, surveys were done in these regions um, in terms of uh, DMI resistance in uh, wheat septoria. However, uh, the results are alarming, I think, and uh, clearly show that um, uh, this uh, fungicide resistance case is there. And based on overseas uh, data, um, most DMIs uh, at least uh, got to the reduced sensitivity phase. Uh, now, these results and also the map uh, may give the impression that we are in trouble when using any kind of fungicides in any kind of uh, uh, grain crops. Uh, however, this is clearly not the case. So I would like to show you just two uh, tables on the next two slides uh, to show that uh, most fungicides that we have uh, at the moment uh, to control uh, all the diseases in barley are still working uh, very well in most places. As you can see in some uh, states, uh, not, um, one or two fungicides have already uh, uh, lost their efficacy. That's the red little X there, or uh, reduced sensitivities were detected uh, in one state or another while the same uh, fungicides belonging to the same group, mode of action group uh, are still working very well in other uh, states. Next slide will show uh, the current field performance of uh, all the fungicides that can be used uh, against wheat diseases. And again, uh, most uh, fungicides uh, work very well in most uh, states uh, across uh, Australia. Um, I, I want to, I want to uh, mention here that uh, not all the products have been registered in all states. So obviously the label will tell uh, which fungicides are uh, useful in what, uh, in which state uh, across the state. But clearly the message, the take home message there is that most fungicides work nicely against most wheat and barley uh, diseases um, across the country. So uh, the next slide uh, will take us back to uh, Queensland, I guess. Uh, as, um, as I mentioned there, there are no well-documented cases uh, in Queensland in ter terms of fungicide resistance. And the question is, why is this? Uh, my feeling is that this is because no um, comprehensive uh, uh, surveys, no projects uh, have been uh, um, done in, uh, in Queensland so far. So uh, we started a, a pilot study, a small project supported by the Broad Acre Cropping Initiative, which is a collaboration between the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries of the Queensland Government and University of Southern Queensland. Uh, I will talk um, here about our preliminary results. However, I would like to stress that uh, this project has started uh, a few months ago. So uh, there's not much to report uh, so far. We focused on one single disease so far, on uh, mung bean powdery mildew. And why is that? Uh, this is because uh, mung bean is a cash crop in uh, southern uh, Queensland, also across Queensland, and also in northern uh, New South Wales. And uh, this disease is almost every year is there in the, in the field. And, uh, the, according to a, to a GRDC uh, paper, uh, there could be up to 30% yield losses uh, without applying uh, fungicides. Now, there are only two fungicides uh, registered against mungbean powdery mildew. Uh, both contain a DMI uh, fungicide, tebuconazole, and um, uh, custodia also contains a strobilurin uh, in combination with tebuconazole. So we uh, checked uh, the uh, uh, the efficacy of, uh, of these two fungicides against mungbean powdery mildew, especially because the main causing uh, agent of this disease, 
uh, which is a powdery mildew species. The name is there on the screen. Uh, Podosphera fusca, it is also known under a number of other names, uh, has already been shown to develop uh, uh, resistance against the DMI uh, fungicides. So the paper there on the screen uh, comes from uh, France laboratory. It's a 10 year old paper that showed that the same powdery mildew developed uh, at least reduced sensitivity to a number of DMI fungicides. Uh, actually, here in Australia, we have another powdery mildew species that infects mungbean. So we have two causal agents there, and this may complicate fungicide resistance at this stage. However, we don't know much about this. The project that I'm talking about uh, was carried in uh, collaboration with uh, Lisa Kelly from the uh, Department of Agriculture and Fisheries and Nilufar Vagefi uh, from our university, University of Southern Queensland. So uh, what we have done so far uh, since we started the, this project a few months ago, if we move to the next slide, we actually checked uh, those DNA markers that are very well known to be associated with uh, DMI resistance, so tabiconazole resistance. We checked in a number of uh, samples, and the good news is that uh, we haven't detected uh, uh, any mutations in the target gene. Uh, however, field failures have been observed. So uh, we would like to uh, get uh, samples uh, from you. If you are interested uh, in finding out uh, whether uh, there is uh, any resistance in uh, mangling powder in mildew pathogens across uh, Queensland and New South Wales. Uh, in terms of management, uh, if we uh, go to the next slide, uh, the current recommendation is to apply uh, tebuconazole uh, DMI fungicide twice, first at first sign of the disease, and then uh, two months late, uh, two weeks later, sorry, so two weeks later. Uh, this slide and the next five slides were received from uh, my colleague, Associate Professor Adam Sparks, um, and uh, they'll show you uh, their results in mungin powder immune management. So um, the re recommendation to use uh, uh, Tebuconazole at first sign of the disease, and uh, then the second spray two weeks later was actually uh, supported by Adam, uh, Adams and Paul Malloy's and also their colleagues' uh, meta analysis. They uh, analyzed uh, the yield data and also all the other data of 26 different trials from uh, Northern uh, New South Wales and Queensland from 2011 till 2019. And uh, this analysis uh, supported the recommendation that I have already mentioned. Now, if you need uh, more support, uh, then uh, it's a good idea to use a decision support system. And uh, uh, this is uh, what uh, Adam and his team actually developed. Uh, this is a, a, a tool that actually provides an alternative to calendar spray programs. And uh, it has a number of economic benefits, those benefits that Steve actually mentioned in, uh, in his presentation. And if there was uh, any fungicide resistance uh, uh, issue, then it would also be a good tool uh, to, uh, to manage uh, fungicide resistance in powder and milk. So what is this uh, decision support system? Uh, this is an app a phone app that was launched uh, in November 2019. It can be downloaded freely. Uh, it is the uh, result of a large collaboration between uh, uh, University of Southern Queensland, uh, Western Australia, Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development, and the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries of the Queensland Government. So this tool is there, and um, I have two more slides to show you uh, what does this app uh, do for you, for the growers, agronomists, or uh, advisors. If we can uh, go to the next slide, please. Uh, so the first, uh, when, uh, when uh, users actually try to use this app for the first time, this is what they see. Uh, they have on the far left uh, parameters that can be adjusted for crop circumstances and current conditions. And then uh, they will get uh, information uh, uh, and uh, to help their decisions. 
what would happen without any fungicide spray, with one spray or with two sprays uh, in that particular crop, uh, according to the already set parameters. So uh, the users are asked to provide uh, crop circumstances, um, which already include uh, the already incurred costs of that uh, uh, mung bean field, also the estimated farm gate price, uh, the yield volatility, and the overall price. And uh, the, the outcomes could be easily tailored to see uh, if it is economic to spray once or twice in terms of the calculated uh, final yield. So this is how this, this app works. Um, I think it's a wonderful uh, tool to support uh, the decisions about fungicide use in, uh, in mung bean uh, fields. Uh, and as I said, uh, this project was supported by, uh, by those two uh, projects that are listed on the, on the screen. Um, and it is a collaboration of, the, uh, of those three organizations um, also shown on the screen, uh, including the, the alliance between uh, the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries of the Queensland Government and the University of Southern Queensland, the Broad Acre Crop Initiative. So um, um, to conclude and uh, to come up with a number of uh, take home messages on the next slide. Um, as we know, uh, to make a decision about fungicide use, uh, there, is, uh, there are risks from the fungicide side. Most of them are single site mode of action. So there's a risk of developing uh, resistance. And also there are a number of risks from the pathogen side and uh, both Steve and Lisa covered uh, this uh, very well um, with a few examples. Clearly, a frequent application of fungicide leads uh, uh, increases the risk of fungicide resistance. So uh, what should we do? Uh, of course, the first recommendation is to rotate and mix chemistries if they are available. Uh, basically, in our example in mungin powder mildew, basically we only have tabuconazole, or uh, so a DMI uh, fungicide, although uh, uh, another product uh, also has strobilurins. So if possible, rotate and mix chemistries. Of course, reduce disease pressure by other means, not by fungicides, by rotate crops, by stubble management and manage the green bridge. And also, uh, last but not least, uh, this is the, take -home, the final take home message, is to minimize fungicide use and uh, <clears throat> try to spray strategically. And this strategy could be supported by uh, the phone app that I presented earlier. So to conclude, it looks like little is known about fungicide resistance in, in Queensland. However, uh, a, at least a pilot project has started in this field, which uh, has uh, focused so far on a single disease. And uh, we will also uh, check other uh, grains pathogens um, for fungicide resistance, and we will also continue to monitor uh, this in, uh, in a number of uh, key uh, grain pathogen, uh, pathogen populations in Queensland. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. Thanks so much for that, Levante. Um, on behalf of the, the whole Apron team, um, thanks for attending the webinar. We're into, I just wanted to cover a few acknowledgements there from the whole team and those slides and information. Um, also just wanted to cover that the Apron team is quite diverse um, from a number of organisations. So please reach out to your regional plant pathologist within the network. Um, and the ways you can connect with Apron are with Twitter, with the hashtag Apron and including the adding the GRDC. Uh, we have a website active, which is grdc.com.au forward slash apron, and that's where the um, webinars go up on uh, later at the end of these sessions. Or you can email me, it'll come to me at apron at curtain.edu.au. And as I said, it's really key to interact with your regional plant pathologists, because at the end of the day, as um, both Stephen and Liesl commented on, getting a good diagnosis is the, the best start to that um, and then if there is a suspected case of fungicide resistance then we can put you in contact with the right people to make sure we're picking that up as soon as possible. 
Um, now we're into the Q&A session. Um, I just wanted to, we'll just, we, you can just keep sending those through. Um, we had some come through prior to the meeting, which I'll just cover off on them um, just for completeness. Um, just wanted to, a shout out, we had a question on how do you suspect that you have fungicide resistance in the fluky world of chickpeas and faba beans fungicide control efforts. Um, and we actually, that we got a response from Jenny Davidson, who's a pulse pathologist on the team on that one. Um, so I'll just read that out. Um, so basically, Jenny has responded that there are no reports of fungicide resistance in faba bean diseases. Um, for chickpea ascochyta blight, there are variable reports of efficacy of azoxystrobin. Some regions say it works relatively well, but they've seen trials where it struggles to control severe epidemics and the competitive product Aviator X Pro and the protectant chlorothalonil are superior in those areas. So no lab testing has been done on fungicide resistance for Ascochyta rabii, especially in those um, strobes um, that she's aware of, and we have no data for that as yet. Um, however, in North America, it's um, good to remember that there is quite a lot of fungicide resistance in the Ascochyta rabii um, to Azoxystrobin if we look abroad for a bit of a risk profile. Uh, in regards to Botrytis cinerea, they may infect chickpea, especially in New South Wales and Queensland. Um, and this same pathogen infects vineyards. And there's loads of evidence from vineyards in the southern region of resistance to carbendism for Botrytis cinerea. So there is the potential for the resistant types to move into chickpea or lentil, but so far carbendism still remains effective in those pulse crops. Uh, she's not sure of the status of the pathogens in vineyards in New South Wales or Queensland. So Jenny's based in South Australia, so she can't comment on the risk in those regions. Um, okay, and so there's that question. Um, next question I'll throw um, to Stephen in a moment. So the next question was when to spray for yellow spot and what is best the best fungicide to use? Yeah, I think this one come come in here. Yeah. So the best best time to spray is after you've got a positive diagnosis. Uh, yellow spot is undoubtedly one of the most misdiagnosed diseases. So unfortunately, anyone sees anything yellow in a wheat crop and goes, it's got to be yellow spot. Um, so yeah, we've done a lot of extension around um, distribution within plants are seeing more and bigger lesions on the lowest leaf and, and smaller and fewer lesions as you go up. So getting that pattern right. Um, but with all, with all the... the the, the wheat, it's about protecting the top three leaves because they're the ones that uh, intercept the most light. Um, and that's what contributes to your, to your yield, the photosynthetic area. So, you know, in a susceptible variety, if you've got uh, high pressure, which ideally you don't if you don't go wheat on wheat, um, then it's really that first brace is around that growth stage 31, 32, when your flag minus two leaf is out. And then a second spray of the season's conducive in a susceptible variety to keep it getting onto the, the top leaves would be again at growth stage 39 when the flag leaf, flag minus two and flag minus one are all out. So um, that's only in really conducive. So we generally see a lot of, uh, or we can see in wheat and wheat situations, a lot of yellow spot early, but usually the season takes care of it. So it's really a function of very wet years, yellow spot, where you get progressive movement um, of those bigger conidia infecting up through the canopy um, is when you really need that. So. Yeah, that's yep. the, that's the basic. In terms of product, mate, not uh, it's whatever's registered. And I think the thing with all this stuff, uh, certainly timing is more important than, than product. So making sure you're getting that on. So if you have to wait two weeks to get a product that you think is slightly better, um, you've probably undone any difference between um, the, the uh, actual products. The big point I want to point out very quickly, I know I babble too much, everyone else who's on listening knows that too, um, but certainly just remember with the, the necrotrophs, so yellow spot, your net watches are necrotrophs, they, they kill the cells and then feed on those cells. There's very little curative activity in any of the fungicides against the necrotrophs. They've got decent curative activity against the biotroph because they're keeping the cells alive, but yeah, basically um, you've got one to two days at best, curative activity German data would show, with the necrotropes. So this raises the whole question. We do it with our ascochyta. We know we've got, got uh, until some of the products now, but we haven't got a lot of curative activities. So we always say you've got to spray in front of a rain event, um, which is an infection event basically with, with um, ascochyta and chickpeas, but we just don't 
to even think about it with our wheat. We just get to it when we get to it. So yeah, certainly for the for, for yellow spot going in front of a rainfall event, which is your main infection event, to get splash of those spores through um, would be more advisable than waiting afterwards because you just don't have that curative activity. Sorry, done. Yeah, brilliant. No, thanks for that, Steve. Um, I might throw the next one to Liesl. Um, it was just a question around best options in wheat and barley. If you want to have a go at that. Oh, just mute. Oh. <laughs> okay, I'm on mute now. Yeah, I think um, I think in Queensland at this stage, I think we have a lot more options than um, you know than a lot of the other regions. I know there's quite a few problems in um, in like in in Southwest WA, um, but I think you know. Um, we still have to be careful. We can't just go out and say, okay, well, you know, we can, we can just keep on spraying and keep on spraying. I think we've been lucky to a large extent that with the drought years we had, there hasn't been a lot of fungicides used. Um, so currently, yeah, as, as Leventi had said, we haven't, you know, in the cereals, we don't have any confirmed cases of radiosensitivity sensitivity or resistance in, in Queensland. Um, but I do think that we have to, um, you know, just just think about um, how you how you use your fungicides. The most important thing is, like um, Stephen said, you know, if you don't have a confirmed disease, um, uh, don't spray. You know, um, wait until you know that you definitely have a disease and not physiological spotting. Then make your decisions around the different groups of fungicides. Don't go and spray multiple sprays of the same fungicide. Um, and then particularly if you have problems with, um, you know, with, with um, septoria tridesi, um, there's quite a few problems there. So have a look at, at what's, not, what's not working. I think for a lot of the diseases, um, it's just, you know, we have to, um, we just have to look at other options as well. So fungicide sprays, yes, that's part of the deal. So don't just say, okay, well, I'll plant the most susceptible variety and I'll just spray whatever disease I get. I think the most important thing is where there's resistant varieties available, you know, use them. I think with yellow spot, for instance, I think the levels of resistance in wheat varieties now is a lot, there's a lot more resistant varieties available for yellow spot than there were, um, you know, say 10 years ago. Um, so that would be your first port of call. And then just look at, you know, um, just use um, your, your paddocks. Um, don't go, a lot of those necrotros, most of them are all basically are stubble born. Don't go back into stubble. I think Steve could maybe comment on the fact that we had so many dry years that a lot of farmers would maybe go back this year into um, you know, paddocks that they had, maybe barley or wheat, like in 2016, 17. Because of the drought we had, all of those stubble didn't break down. So you still run the risk of getting um, stubble infections from those crops from a few years ago. Um, and, and yeah, so, so that's, that's, that's all of those um, is just, and, and talk to your agronomist. I don't think, um, we don't we don't work with fungicides on a daily basis, and I think um, you know talk to your agronomist on what's the best fungicide to use, and then also if you have any problems, I'd say that would be your first port of call. Is talk to your agronomist and say, hey, I've sprayed this fungicide. This was the conditions; it didn't work. And then you know maybe maybe there's other people that are aware of the same problems. So I think that's the whole thing: is we just have to be on top of it. Um, and and yeah, the most important thing is is um, yeah, use those different groups of fungicides that are available and, and don't spray if it's not necessary. If there's not, a, if there's not disease, don't spray it. Yeah. And Stephen, some extra commentary on that? Oh yeah, that's just about the longevity of inoculum. So we know after a run of dry years, the stubble's not decomposing. So some of these pathogens are surviving longer than, than they normally would. But it's also the the, patho the stubble-borne pathogens have a life cycle which requires moisture themselves. So we've certainly seen last year, a bigger risk wasn't barley on 218 barley stubble. It was actually barley on 217, 216 stubble because the net blotch fungus had met its uh, moisture requirement. There. Just quickly, I'm not going to get into one product today, but just be careful. But if that um, we did have, have had a fair few growers, and, and because of price of durum, jump out of barley uh, into durum quite late too, with, with wet conditions. 
um, if we do have a wet year as predicted and we know that barley was going into paddocks because of higher crown rot risk, um, we could have a headlight risk if we get um, rainfall and high humidity during grain filling. The issue I want to raise there is the only product that's registered for a head wash and is quite effective uh, for fusarium head blight is Prozaro, which is made up of prothioconazole and tebiconazole. The thing that you need to be aware of is there is max loadings on the tebiconazole component that you can spray within the year to not exceed MRLs. So if you're doing sprays um, particularly earlier, so if you say we do get this Stripe Rust 198 uh, pathotype eventuate, you need to spray your germ to keep that out. You might want to not use a teb and tebiconazole as that product, maybe use a propiconazole or something else, so that you don't lock yourself out for using that Prozara if you can get hold of it to control that, that head light. Um, so there's a lot of things that agronomists are talking about is, is thinking a head light. You know, ideally, we get a heap of rain and it stops raining uh, around that flowering time and we don't have to worry about it. But if that does eventuate, um, and just the other big thing, particularly grazing crops, look at your withholding periods from grazing. Withholding periods from, from harvest, I don't think that gets looked at enough. Um, certainly a lot of panic people asking, well, if we can't get Prozaro, what are we going to spray? Well, you can't legally spray anything. And questions were even asked about Aviator Expo. Well, we'll use Aviator Expo. It's like you can't. You can't apply it after growth stage 45. So we don't want this panic happening if we do go wet and diseases come in and we exceed MRLs. It doesn't do the whole industry any benefits if we, we have a product that's, that's picked up that's over those, those residue limits. So they're in place for a reason. Let's just you know, have a bit of forethought and not get into panic situations. Yeah. Good reminders there. Thanks, Steve. Um, just, we've had a couple of a comment come through and you might want to speak to this, Stephen. With cereal stubble, the king of fallows, it can be hard to shift to paddocks of good moisture buildup. Does that make sense? Is there any, has, does that change anything in the, I'm not the scheme of things? Oh, I think, well, I don't know. I, I, um, I assume they're alluding to the fact that on Oh, yeah. unfortunately, we're losing Steve there. I think I'm not the only one. Um, Oops. Yep. Am I back? Yes, you're back. Okay. Sorry, that was me, uh, short attention, and I pulled it out of the uh, port. Um, <laughs> I just, just keep it on your toes, that's all. Now, I think what they're alluding to there is that our system, um, and, and it's, 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 it's all regions, it's not just the northern, but certainly the north with our high clay contents, we're relying on that stubble. And we've, we've, we've shown, or, you know, we've suffered the penalty of, of not having enough cereals. So we certainly chickpea price going up and, and that big chickpea production, not having the stubble cover during droughts and not getting that fallow moisture storage. So I think the question's alluding to the whole fact that, well, when we're so reliant on retention of cereal stubbles, how do we manage our diseases? And that's where it really comes to an integrated approach. So it's looking at, um, you know, what's the build up on that stubble? What's the resistance of the varieties? You know, is there things we can do like with uh, crown rot, I guess is the other one that's stubble borne, you know, with inter row sowing and other, other factors. So it becomes a whole integrated approach that you have to take in that situation. So we can't afford not to have the cereal stubble there. We just can't, we won't grow crops. We won't get the fallow moisture storage. So we have to then look at, at uh, all the tools in, in the bag to actually manage the diseases that pop up then. So is, is the way to go there. And yeah, and that's the thing at the moment, it's, it's, it's relatively economical because we've got some triazoles that are cheaper. So it's all about prolonging the activity of those and not you know, overusing those when they're not needed. And, and then suddenly, you know, something everyone says is a, a two to $3 per hectare spray becomes a $20 spray. That really reduces the profitability. So we've got them, we've got to use them and maintain them for as long as we can. So yeah, integrate it. Brilliant, no worries. Um, we've just got a question, uh, sorry, for uh, Stephen or Liesl. Um, does any of our millets present the same risk, like disease problem as cereal diseases? Um, so, so millets in terms of your leaf diseases, no. Um, but yeah, we certainly have had the millets can host uh, the Fusarium species, Fusarium pseudograminiarum, and can also host graminiarum, which is one of the big headlights. So yeah, the millets can be a risk in terms of either you know carry over a crown rot or carry over a fusarium head blight, but yeah not for not so much for your leaf diseases okay yep and but i'll just make a comment and i yeah. can't remember which way it goes the, the white french and the jap would actually differential hosting there was some work that was done with um our northern grower alliance was involved with the four cast up with on the board of did that work as well with uh, lester burgess yep yeah dig it out 
<laughs> dig it out. <laughs> yeah, no worries. I was going to say Leicester, it'd be a few years ago. Um, but uh, just uh, we just had a comment as well, just for those um, who were interested in the um, pulses question, just a comment from um, the, a pulse pathologist, Kevin Moore in Tamworth, um, that I just want to go through. So just saying that there's no evidence for fungicide failures for chickpea ascochyta that can't be explained by timing. So we've touched on that, you've got to get your timing right. But he's concerned that farmers and agros are opting for Aviator X Pro and Veritas when um, chlorothalonil and mancozeb are fine as preventatives. So it really comes down to your timing. So um, yep, definitely if you're in those New South Wales regions, reach out to, to Kevin as well at Tamworth to um, follow up on any of those concerns around fungicide activity in the pulses. Um, so I just wanted to go to a question asked during the session. Um, on, and I'll throw to you, Kat, for this one. Um, if fungicide resistance or the reduced sensitivity is detected in the pathogen populations in the lab, why is this not always reflected in the field? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, there could be a few reasons for that. So um, one of the first things that springs to mind, of course, is um, the frequency with which the pathogen is present in the paddock. So if we detect something in the lab, say for example, using digital PCR, which is um, one of the techniques that uh, we recently published a paper on, if it's present at very low levels, we might not see that uh, reflective field failure. But of course, that's the beautiful thing about our detection technologies that they're able to detect resistance before it becomes a problem, which is basically what our main aim is um, for these technologies so that it's an indication of risk and that um, uh, spray practices can be adjusted before it becomes uh, a major issue. Sometimes it can depend on the type of mutation as well, um, like in powdery mildews, whether it's the first gateway mutation or the second mutation, which have effects on uh, the resistance profile um, of the pathogen. Um, yeah, that would be, um, basically two main reasons that I could think of why there might be a discrepancy there. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks for that, Kat. Um, and I have one for Levante. Um, when and where was the field failure occurred occurring in powdery mildew in mung beans? And do you know why? Uh, let me answer the second part of the question first. I don't know why. Uh, so uh, such cases where uh, where seen in 2017 in Darling Downs uh, around Tuvumba. Uh, that time we, we didn't um, even consider uh, looking at uh, fungicide resistance in, in mung bean powder in Nugu. However, there were, uh, there were paddocks uh, sprayed twice uh, according to the recommendation. And after the second spray, uh, the powder in Nugu was still there and sporulated heavily. So this could have been done because of a number of things. We talked about this timing, uh, problems with the spray and so on and so on. Uh, so I, I can't uh, say more than that, but yes, there were cases like that when uh, two sprays with tepiconazole uh, didn't uh, control the disease in mind. Okay, brilliant. Yeah, so I guess that's why you're looking into it further. Um, so yeah, lots of research is underway. Um, we've had some great questions there. We're at an hour and a quarter already, so I'll probably pull it to a close unless there are any absolute burning questions. And please feel free to get in touch um, if you've got anything you want us to follow up on outside of this webinar. But I'd thank um, Stephen, Liesl, Levente and Catherine for being on the call and providing their expertise and input today and big thanks to the Ag Communicators crowd for keeping it running um, and most of those technical difficulties with slides going back and forth was on me so um, and just that final reminder because we did have a question prior to the webinar as well that basically good disease management will usually help you manage well for fungicide resistance as well. So in these regions where we haven't seen any horror case studies like we have seen in other parts of the country, just remember to put all of your tools in your toolbox. As Stephen said, that you know you just have to look 
at the full suite of those. And um, I, I certainly delve into a lot of the GRDC publications around what that can look like, um, which you can get on the GRDC website as well. So without further ado, I will uh, close the session and yep, thanks for attending. It's been absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Carly.